Tathagatasa Bhagavato Arahato Asamma Sambuddhasa Namo Tathagatasa Bhagavato Arahato Asamma Sambuddhasa Namo Tathagatasa Bhagavato Arahato Asamma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami so this is the first official Rains Retreat talk. And um, I was supposed to uh, talk about having a theme for the Rains Retreat. So I thought uh, maybe we could start with the essential dhammas. Maybe go through the uh, three cardinal suttas. And then after that, maybe the seven bojangles. So that would take us almost to... Uh, 11 weeks, so that's about uh, the length of the Rains Retreat. So the first sutta, and uh, not being a scholar, we'll use the sutta as a launching pad. And then uh, we'll pick bits and pieces, bits and pieces, the highlights that I like to remind people, and uh, we'll go from there. And the thing that strikes me with the, uh, the first sutta that the Buddha taught, the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, um, was obviously this well known sutta, and many of you have known it, that the Buddha talked about suffering. So the narrative goes, you know, suffering. And then that's how we get labeled Buddhism, Theravada. It's all about suffering. Not entirely true. He said there is suffering. He's only, he didn't say there's only suffering, he said there is suffering, which means obviously at any moment in our life, there is some sort of discomfort, stress, worries, and tension. But that's not the only thing that's going on. There's also, you know, um, inspiration. There's also energy. There's also faith. There's also love and wisdom and all these beautiful other aspects in life that we can pay attention to. And, uh, but since the Buddha did focus on the teaching of uh, suffering, dukkha, or stress. It's because, obviously, you know, it's a well-honed um, point. It's like unless we understand suffering, we are bound to uh, repeat. We're bound to continue to suffer. So it's a fair enough point. Um, but also, even though we spoke this morning that I was going to stay away from Keep to my lane, stay away from uh, not self, which is Ajahn Teradamo's specialty. But they're obviously the three characteristics tied together. And this is something I just want to point out that if you are suffering, you're feeling annoyed, stressed, anxious, usually there is a self in there somewhere a self to defend, to protect, a self to. Uh, um, to project. So if you're suffering, just look around. Usually there's a self in there at work. If there's no self, there's no suffering. Because we know people get sick all the time. But we don't suffer all of other people's sickness unless they're close ones. We suffer because we are sick. We suffer much more so if we get depressed or sad. We know there are tragedies in the world all the time. We read about it. But it doesn't affect us as much unless our precious self or the people we love, that we, that we, the people we attach to, meets with this suffering. So obviously there is a selfing in there. So it's a good reflection when, there are, when we are suffering, feeling stressed or worry. Where is my sense of self, where is it that I'm really attaching to? Where is it I'm making a self out of? Having said that, I want to point out to the more aspirational, more uplifting aspect of the Buddha's first teaching. It's this implication. Obviously, the Dhamma Chaka, Pavatana Sutta, created the first five stream enter. 
And that is pretty cool, I think, because it doesn't say, I mean, Buddha can become enlightened, but he's whatever, super special, superhuman, gets great DNA, he's been doing this for many, many lifetimes. But, you know, what does it say about other people, like ordinary beings like us? But the fact that he taught other people, and that through the realization, through the following the Buddha's teaching, that you have five stream enter after the teaching, and obviously um, through his teaching, throughout his 45 years of teaching, there are many beings that become enlightened. So the first sutta has a great implication that each and every one of us has the capacity that the Buddhist teaching is not something, you know, that Buddhist enlightenment is not lost. It's not an individual thing. It's something that can be taught, can be pointed to. That if we do the work, we train our mind, we understand suffering, we will also be a noble one. So that's why it's called the noble, four noble truths, because understanding those truths, we become noble ones, enlightened beings beings on the path, being on the stream. And that's a great thing to remember, to not lose sight of. That the Buddha's teaching is something that can be transmitted, something that we can understand. It doesn't take, you know, a super smart being. It doesn't take a super pure being. It just takes intention, dedication, it takes patience. It's just to continue walking the path laid up on the Buddha. And it's, yeah, at the end of it, we read in English, it's great. It's like a great surpassing light, surpassing all the beautiful thing, all the devas shown on earth. So it shows that, you know, the power of truth. Truth has power something that has resonated throughout the ages, throughout, you know, culture. Truth is something that is immutable. So we can feel it, regardless of whatever our cultural background is. Something that we gravitate, you know, gravitate towards. Everybody here has come from, you know, many different cultural backgrounds, conditionings. Yeah, we're all here together in the same place, same time practicing together. It speaks to the power of the Dhamma, the power of truth, so we can feel it, even though we don't totally understand it. And that's the thing. We're all here together practicing, of encouraging us, going in the same direction. So when you wake up in the morning, just count your blessings. You're doing up health in a monastery, a lot of opportunity to practice, to cultivate wholesome states, not just in sitting meditation, but you know, in doing chores, all throughout the day. Always lots of opportunities to practice kindness, compassion, care, practice awareness. And it's as if we're all in the stream. This might be dumbing down the Dhamma. We're in the stream already, in the stream of Dhamma. As long as you don't step out of it, you continue with this path. It only heads one way, head towards liberation, Nibbana. As long as we keep on walking the path of the Buddha, as long as we keep on cultivating wholesome states, day in and day out, one day at a time, one step at a time, one breath at a time. So whether you're here for the weekend, Next three months, my favorite place, I say over and over again, nothing to do, nowhere to go.
You're here already. Main thing is, in the monastery, on the cushion, main thing to do is just to be here, to allow the mind to be still. And that sometimes that takes time. But the main thing is to be at peace, to make peace with the thinking mind, to make peace with the grumbling mind, to make peace with the sad, depressed mind, to make peace with the complaining mind. It all belongs. Sometimes we like, oh, I like it when I'm inspired. I like when I'm happy. I don't like when I'm grumbling. I don't like this bit of me. I don't like when I'm sad or depressed. But that's part of the stress. It's the disassociating the bad bit. It's, it's hard to, part of the spiritual practice, part of the spiritual path is its ability to open yourself up, to accept all parts of yourself, the beautiful and the bad one, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the horrible, the crazy ones. It all belongs, really. Everything belongs, everything has its place. Just to acceptance, to understanding. And these things transform themselves, not through our willpower, but through the power of the Dhamma. To understand the grumbling mind, to understand the sad, anxious mind, to understand the fearful mind. What does that feel like? How does it ex express itself in the body? How does it express itself in the present moment? It is through understanding that liberation happens, not through disassociating, not through pushing things away. So in the practice, there's not a lot. You don't have to do a whole lot. You just have to be present, to be here, really to accept things. And through the acceptance, things transform themselves. So when we wake up in the morning, just bring up a lot of happiness and gratitude. There's the ability, the opportunity, just to bow to the Buddha, to bow to the Dhamma, to bow to the Sangha. You're already ahead. You keep an A precept way ahead. Anything else? What the mind does, that's all icing on top. Whether it thinks a lot, whether it gets the body gets achy, that's not so important. You're in the monastery, sitting, sharing the space with so many like-minded people. People who have purity of intention. Not perfect, but perfect in their intention of wanting to cultivate wholesome states. Wanting to do the right thing. Wanting to practice you know, care and compassion. Wanting to support each other. And that's a beautiful thing that we should always remember over and over again. And then the mind will calm down by itself, just focusing on the blessings, focusing on the wholesome states. I think the Bible says somewhere, be still and know that I'm God. In Buddhism, but the Buddhist answer to that, be still and know that you are a God. You are perfection. The world is perfection because it comes through causes and conditions. It can't be any other ways. When the mind becomes still, there is acceptance. There's understanding. It happens naturally. It is through the wanting, the wishing, the craving, the longing that we start to stir the mind. 
And we sit meditation, just sitting, just being, just watching. Watching the breath, watching the mind, watching the body, and being with it, allowing those things to calm down in their own pace. Sometimes they calm down a bit too much, and you're in la-la land, but that's okay. Not anyway, it's never killed anybody. At least you're on the cushion. At least you're, on the, you're not in bed. Not in the sala. So, you know, there's so many, you know, we, we're kind of grown up, conditioned to look at all the negative things in our life, in our mind, in ourselves. And that's why I'm in the monastery. I want to be the better. I want to be free from anger. I don't want to drink, smoke pot. I don't want to stop playing computer games. I want to be a better person. And it's fine. We have things to work on. But it's also important to focus on the other things that are going right in our lives as well. So we don't get overwhelmed with the negativities in life, the shortcomings. So we're here in the stream already. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy the wholesome state of mind that we were cultivating. Enjoy and get to know who you are, this body and mind that we're with. It is a great adventure. Like I said, before I was a monk, I traveled, lots of things everywhere. Never was more interesting than the last 20 years of sitting mostly in the forest, getting to know my body and my mind. So much more interesting. When you don't have a clear mind, it's just you. Another city, just another meal, just another person. And when the mind is calm and happy and grateful, everything is an adventure. Everything is beautiful. So on this journey of ours, we're not going onwards, hopefully. We're going inward. Inward to the body and mind. Inward to the present moment. The key to wisdom is going inward. Inward and inward, not onward. I'm not going to get my jhanas and get my own wisdom, write my books, be finished, and then I'm going to do other things after I become enlightened. It's just staying in the present moment and allowing that to open up. However, that does. Allowing the mind to show you what is inside of it. And all it takes is awareness, present, a bit of love that allows us to stay in the present moment. If you don't have love, you don't have acceptance, you don't have care, that's when the mind moves. If there's greed, then it moves towards this object it wants. If there's aversion, it moves away from the present moment. So hence, that's why a little acceptance, a little care and compassion, a little love, will allow you to stay in the present moment. It allows you to understand, to see things more clearly. There it is. Every range is different. But, yeah, I think uh, the sense of uh, interest, excitement for this journey we're all taking together. So, strap on your seatbelt and enjoy the ride. So, I'll offer that for your reflection tonight. Satsang with Mooji